George Trombolopoulos, welcome to the public. Uh, honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Now it's it's the tenth season. You've recently started for your show on CBC. If you're the type of person who is nostalgic or or sentimental or even prone to thinking about milestones, it's often a time to look back and see how things have changed, how how things have come. Are, are you that type of person? And if so, have you been thinking about the past ten years and how you've changed and how the show has changed? You know, I'm not I'm not huge on sentiment, but I am I think a little bit sentimental, and I'm not sure if that's just my chemistry changing as I get older. Um, but the truth is about this show, you're so stuck in it, you know, working from the inside out that you don't even notice 10 years are passing. You're just fighting every show, wrestling every interview to the ground, wrestling your network, wrestling your public, wrestling your own mind, you know, that you you are aware that something is happening and you are aware that it is succeeding, but you're not really aware of what it is. And... I'll walk into the show to do the show, and when the audience is sitting there, there's a a highlight reel that plays beforehand, and I'll see the guests that have been on the show, and I'm often surprised, like we've had everybody on this show. So, so I, I I've been given a, a pause to reflect, but it's not something that I was aware of at the time that it was going to be that kind of show. I was reading interviews, and it sounds like when you first reluctantly almost uh, accepted uh, CBC's offer that you thought you were going to be off the air in a month. You really didn't think you were the right fit. Um, are you amazed? Have you had the chance to think like, you know, a decade, that's more staying power than uh, than very many people on television? Yeah, there haven't been any daily talk shows to ever do this. We're the first of our kind. Um, it's because of CBC, though. That's the thing, right? So I didn't want to work here because I didn't think they would let me do what I needed to do. And the truth is, I don't think they would have unless it was for somebody called Jennifer Detman, right? So I had this one producer who was the executive producer of the show. It was her, this person called Susan Taylor, who I just, the radio audience doesn't know this, but I just popped out of this office very quickly, was to see her. I still work with her. So the two of them, this guy called Heat and Dyer, we, we sat down and we created a safety zone where... While CBC was being CBC, I didn't have to deal with it. And we didn't have to deal with it. We were given a lot of protection. And then once we got on our feet, we were able to really work with CBC in a way that was helpful. So much of what I thought would be an issue, um, I was insulated from in the very beginning. And I think all shows should be insulated from their own network, not just CBC. You mean in that you didn't have to feel self-conscious or, or get the direct feedback right away, so you had a bit of space to be yourself? Yeah, we, we had the feedback, but it was more like... Everybody has an opinion of what CBC ought to be, right? Because it's the public broadcaster. But when a new guy comes in who looks like me, who speaks like me, who listens to the sorts of things I listen to, communicates the way I do, there aren't a lot of places for that guy in network television, right? For a guy like me. Um, And people inside CBC knew it. A lot of people here didn't want me to be here, but a lot of people did. And they protected me in the beginning from the sharks, which is what I needed. Then you get your own legs and then you, then the sharks can't get you, you know? But there's so many great people inside the building and I didn't realize how positive it would be because I had a preconceived notion from the outside of what CBC would be. So once I got here and found my way through it, it became very great. Peter Mansbridge uh, really, really ensured the show developed. Peter Mansbridge embraced us, endorsed us, was a mentor to me, gave me great advice. Um, it was always there and still is. Now, you recently finished uh, your summer show on, on CNN. Um, and like you just mentioned, you when you were doing some of the promo leading up to the, the premiere of the series, you said, um, you know, a guy like me, it's rare that they're actually be on, on television. And there was a bit of there was a bit of flack uh, that people yeah, said, you know, a like a flag from one person. There was a bit of flack from one person in this city. And it was super boring commentary from this person. They missed the point entirely. Dude, guys with earrings and who listen to Slayer don't host talk shows on news channels and interview presidents. That doesn't happen, right? It's not about me. It's about people like me. And that's what the person didn't understand, right? Because to be honest with you, I find most media in Canada, like print media, uh, critical. Like it's cynical, not critical. Critical thinking is interesting. Cynicism is boring. Cynicism is for you and your friends at at the beer hall. I'm not interested in cynical. I'm interested in critical thinking. What I was saying was that there aren't a lot of cats like us. And you know who tells me that? Everybody in those networks and everybody who sits in that red chair. But it wasn't about me. It was about what we represent, this new version of what you could be at 40. You know, I was 40 years old on CNN doing this talk show. And it was kind of like it was surprising to a lot of people that it happened. 
You know, even newspapers down there were writing about it. It's like, this guy has a, there's no guys with earrings even, you know, who are on a show like this, doing a show like this, having the conversations that we were having. That was the point that I was trying to make. Hey, well, it, it seems like you certainly had uh, not a traditional childhood, uh, certainly in, in that respect. You're not, uh, you know, you struggle in school. You're raised by uh, a single parent. I want to ask you a, a bit about that and how that influenced you. It seems rather unlikely that you ended up in, in broadcasting if you were just to know your first uh, 18 yeah. years. Can, can you tell me a bit about what the scene was growing up? You, Your dad left when you were seven? Yeah. Seven. Yeah, I think that there are lots of kids of single families, single parent families, single mothers or single fathers um, who do just fine, right? I just think that it was just in, in my particular neighborhood, in my particular family, broadcast wasn't a path. But I didn't even know it was a job. Like, how do you go get a job on TV? I never even considered it. Never even thought about being on TV. I, in fact, I didn't even think about TV even when Much Music called me. I didn't even think about TV. I was like, what? The guys, I don't do TV. I don't know what that is. I didn't watch much music. I didn't know what the path to TV was. So I never, you might as well have said, let's, that's the old cliche, right? You might as well have said you're going to work in Mars. Like that's how far away from my, my upbringing it was. But that wasn't unique to me. That was just to the neighborhood. And I'm sure there are neighborhoods like that all across uh, North America where you- and Is this Malton? Like a yeah, suburb of Mississauga? It was Jane, I lived in Jane Wilson, Jane and Fincher area, a uh, place uh, called Chalk Farm, Rexdale, and then Malton, uh, which is where the airport was. And it was still 416 at the time, which is important to note. <laughs> and um, and so I just, you know, just kind of worked as a movie theater usher, drove a forklift at the airport, worked at a bookstore at the airport, worked at Subway Sandwiches almost all at the same time, um, and just was looking for something to do for a living. And was flipping through. A, I went to get a motorcycle license. And you get this course calendar for Humber College, which was the college across the street from the mall that I worked at. I was a teenager and I saw radio production. I went, oh, hell, I'll take that. That's it. It was a fluke, man. I d had I not decided to get the motorcycle license, everybody had tried to dissuade me from that plan. Had I listened, I would never have picked up that course calendar. If I didn't pick up that course calendar, I wouldn't have seen radio. I wouldn't even have known you could do it. I remember going home and telling my mom, I'm going to apply for radio. And she couldn't even comprehend what that meant. Not that she's like, no, 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 that's not a real job. She didn't even know. What do you mean you're going to be in radio? What is that? What, what, what kind of job? What is the job? Well, I'm going to talk and I'm going to play music. She's like, that's a job? I, I don't know. I'm going to see. Right? So it was not, I'm a, vict, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a very lucky recipient of breaks from the algorithm. Lots of lucky moments that uh, allowed me to kind of sneak into this line of work, but never part of the plan. It's, it sounds from, from reading other things uh, that you've said in interviews that the fact that you were raised by just your mom had quite the influence on you in, in that, you know, no one, no one self-made and people are in the situations in which they were or are because of a context, a particular yeah. circumstances. There's one story I heard about how um, she would be working single jobs, she couldn't afford daycare. So she would drop you off at you and your sister off at the library and then at a senior's home. Is that is that true? My mom would drop me off at the uh, Albion Public Library. Um, and in the morning, I didn't know this until later, but years later, she would take us to the library and then she would leave. But she would ask the librarians to make sure we didn't leave. Sometimes it was just me because my sister was really young at the time. Um, so my sister would be with my aunt or something. But I would walk around the library and I would just read books and librarians would check in on me regularly. Hey, how you doing? What are you? And they would give me these little like book reading lists, things that I could read. What are you interested in? I'm interested. I would. I remember saying I was interested in, uh, in native stuff back then. That's what we called it in the 70s. Uh, and so she, they would hand me books written about First Nations culture and I would read them when I was, you know, five, six, seven years old. Then she would come meet us for lunch. My mom would. I guess she decided to spare the librarians the second shift, <laughs> keeping an eye on me, and then would drive us up the street to, uh, God, what was it called? Central Park Lodge, I think is what it was called. It was a senior citizen's home on the corner, and she knew somebody there. And my mom has always operated from a place of empathy and a place of service. Uh, and I grew up with a strong sense of service. Um, and she would say, go in there and find somebody who has nobody and be their friend. And I was really young, but she would say, like, those, some of the people in here have no family. Either they're not alive or they don't come to visit them when they are lonely. And it is your job as a human being to be there for other people. So go talk to them, but more importantly, listen to them. 
This is my, remember my mom. My mom, if I look back at it, man, when I was seven, my mom would have been 25, 26. She was a baby, man. She was a baby <laughs> raising these two kids by herself. Um, we had a wonderful family, right? Like my, my mother's mother, my grandmother, my uncle, my aunt were incredible. So I never felt alone. So I, I was able to, through that experience, understand my responsibility to society. And would you, so you would just literally be left alone and, and walk the halls and just walk into yeah, a room where yeah, someone well, was alone? Yeah. I'd walk the halls and she'd be beside me and she would go visit this woman called Miss Buckle. She'd go see Kay Buckle in one room and she'd be like, go, go, go down there. And I would go down there and I'd see a guy. He'd be like, hi, what's your name? I'm like, I'm George. And what's your name? I'm Jim. And then I would go in, I would sit down. He's like, come on in. And we would just talk. That's exactly what it was. Um, my mother was really big on protecting me to a degree, but only to a degree. It was, you know, like kids now, and I get it, man, because parents now are, are the modern parent. I guess there's lots of positive stuff, but parents are ultra protective of kids, certainly in urban settings, right? But my mom was like, go outside. Go talk to that guy. My mom didn't even know she was socializing me, but she was socializing me, right? She was never... If she was afraid, and I knew she was later, I found out, but if she was, she never let on, right? Another thing my mom did, which is really important to me, and I would say this to any parent out there, my mom said multiple times to me, she used to call me Bucky. She said, Bucky, you're not special. You're like, you're special to me, but you're not special. You're the same as everybody else. You're the same as everybody else, and that's good. Don't, don't be asked, don't be wandering around like you have some destiny or you're this thing. She never, she says, no, but you're just like everybody else, man. And if you work really hard and things work out, then you might be okay. That was the life lesson I learned from my mom. And I'm so thankful that that's how she approached it with me. Never put any pressure on me to find a career, none of that stuff. So I suspect that that context allowed me to develop other parts of my personality, which ultimately led me to here. Well, I was, I was surprised when I read that because um, like you, like you just mentioned, you said that she didn't have any expectations of you really yeah. your family you said at one point um expected you to just be a bus driver yeah my grandmother was really my baba was very interested in me being a bus driver she said um because i could sit down for a living and be in the union but that was my but like you know i it's the honor and dignity of the blue collar it's the honor and dignity of the working class everybody in my family except for me worked at a golf course and i remember i'd, I'd see some people go oh i heard your family is connected to so-and-so golf course. We were members too. And then I would say, oh, no, no, <laughs> we weren't members. My grandmother cleaned the bathroom after you left. Like, that's my family. But that's great. There was never, never in my life did we ever think, oh, we could have been. No, we were. We were a good family. And it was a working class family. I think that's fantastic. I didn't work at the golf course because I drove a forklift at the airport. But it was a blue collar job. I had steel toe boots. You know, I tried to work on Saturday so I could get the shift premium, <laughs> a little bit extra money, you know. Um, but that was, that's the context in which we grew up, which was, look, man, you go to work. You go to work and you love your job. And if you don't love your job, find what you could love about it and then have a nice life. That was, I mean, that's to really, I think, at least for my chemistry, that was a really impactful way for me to grow up. The reason I was so surprised by that is, you know, obviously having on the other end of the spectrum, a lot of expectations directed towards you can be very debilitating and, and sort of uh, paralyze you in a way. And it's it always paralyzing. It's always paralyzing. People may succeed. They think it's because of it. It's not, man. It's in spite of it. Telling a 16-year-old kid how to perform to set themselves up from when they're 40 is such bullshit. It's such bullshit because nobody at 16 can be asked to know what they want to do for the rest of their lives. Sure, expectations if they're specific, like you, yeah. you should be a hotshot lawyer or something like yeah. that. But if it's more generalized, like expectations that, oh, you're smart or you're creative or, or some of these just positive characteristics, then it can be a very positive thing in that we, I think, generally as humans, seem to live up to other people's expectations. Same with if they're low, if people don't expect much of us, we also seem to to live up to, to that. Yeah. So I, that's why I was curious, like if, if no one expects you to transcend, you know, a, a blue collar job. Then, um, how did why did that fuel your fire? I never had the fire to um, to go beyond it. I didn't think that I didn't think that one needed to transcend a blue collar job. I thought a blue collar job is a good job. A job is a job, right? Um, and yet, you need a lot of ambition and a lot of gusto to, to end up in, in the places where you have. Therein lies the rub with me that is almost impossible to figure out. I don't have any ambition. 
I don't have ambition. I have drive. And I don't know what it's about. I don't know where it's from. I don't know why. I What's the drive. distinction to you? Ambition is you have, you, it's, it's, ambition is like, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to be something. I want to, uh, my ambition is to, to, to be better than this or this or whatever. It's like, it's a, it's a, it's a, you can quantify what it is you want. You're looking forward to a peak on a mountain you want to get to or something. Yeah, man, there is no mountain in my world, right? So, so you have I, your head down and are just marching forward type of thing. I have a, uh, a, a fuel cell in me that burns and whichever direction it happens to be pointed is the direction I go. But I don't have this, I never had to prove anything to anybody. More importantly, I never had to prove anything to myself. I have no, like, I have no ego about this job whatsoever. I'm confident in my ability to escape life as a human being. I'm confident in that. But I have no ego about this because I know how much luck has to go into it. I had a drama teacher and an English teacher who um, saved me in high school. Without him, I don't do this for a living. Then I get to a radio station and I had a, uh, a music director who looked at me and said, oh, I think this kid knows a little bit about heavy metal. Why don't you just do this show? He didn't know me. Why don't you just do this show? You know a little bit about metal, right? Okay, so that happens. Then I come back to Toronto and I work there and I happen to answer the phone one day late at night. I mean, I was there on my day off because I was just wanted to be around it. So I had the initiative to be around it, but that's just because I love to be around it. And I answered the phone and the, the guy was called Alan Davis and he said, who is this? I said, it's George. He said it in a much friendlier way. I said, it's George. And he said, hey, you want to be on the radio, don't you, someday? And I said, yeah, I do, actually. He goes, okay, well, why don't you start doing these sports updates because um, uh, you can go across the country and practice. I said, oh, my God, I was so excited. It's my break. I said, yeah, sure, when? Thinking it would be a week or so. He said, in an hour. I forgot to schedule somebody. So I just happened to pick up the phone, right? So many breaks. I had a great boss called Bob Makowitz, um Sr., who, when I would make mistakes, would pull me aside and help me out. He had no reason to. Don Landry, who I was on the earth on Saturdays, Jim Richards, these guys had no reason to just give me a break, but they gave me breaks. So you need the grace of others, man. The grace of others and the fluke of the algorithm, whatever that is. Some people think it's the universe. Other people think it's God or whatever. To me, it's just math. Um, so, so much luck has to go into presenting you the opportunity. Hard work, talent, dedication, and all that stuff are what prepares you to make something of that opportunity. So it's not all luck. But I know many talented people who work hard who didn't get the breaks. I'm, I'm going to walk around and act like I'm better than them. Of course I'm not. I just got breaks. And everybody in this business got breaks. There's no such thing as a self-made person in this business. This isn't like 1944, someone escapes here and comes here post-war with nothing, with $4 in their pocket and builds an empire. That's a lot of luck has to go into that too. But that's not what this business is. Nobody in this business, right, is, is like that post-war story, right? Um, so, like, I recognize that I'm very blessed to be here. My work ethic and drive is what, and, and whatever tiny bit of, if I have any natural ability or developed ability, is just my way of honoring the opportunity I've been given. You know, that's all that is. Did you have a lot of mis misdirected energy uh, growing up? I mean, it sounds from reading about your high school days that, you know, you failed a few courses and you felt uh, not understood. Uh, and this drama teacher uh, sort of sort of got you in a, in a sense and sort of helped you come out of the shelf. Did, did you, were you ever close to getting into trouble or, or did you have a lot of misguided energy as a, as a kid? Sure, sure, of course I did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I never understand when people say they have no regrets. I have so many, <laughs> so many regrets based on my behavior and my choices. And it's not good enough to say I was just young, you know? And what did, were you getting in trouble with the cops or with, at school or? or? Yes, all kinds of trouble, right? And, you know, all kinds of trouble, putting myself in really dumb situations, making bad choices, sometimes being enabled, sometimes enabling, you know, um, bad behavior, misspent youth in a way. But again, very lucky, very lucky. My mom seemed to figure it out. Uh, the neighborhood I grew up in at the time I grew up in, Malton especially at that time was very unique in that it was jammed between Toronto and Mississauga, very ethnically diverse, to the lower end of the social class in terms of socioeconomic status. But Sikhs, Hindus, side by side. Pakistanis, Indians, side by side. Bikers multiple 
versions of Caribbean culture there. So when I grew up at 12, I knew the difference between Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica, right? I knew what Haiti was. Like, you see this stuff. So you grow up in this really diverse community that, that means you can get in lots of trouble because we're all kind of just a bunch of lost boys wandering around. Um, but you also see the world from everybody else's point of view, right? So it's a real big empathy builder to grow up in neighborhoods like that, I think, um, because you, you actually understand, all right, so all these different religions, all these different cultures, and, but one common, common thing between everybody is you've got to go to work, got to get jobs got to work, got to provide for your family, whatever that means, right? So I think that as much as I got into a little bit of trouble here and there, and I did have misspent youth, I think no different than most young guys, um, or young girls for that matter, but I was able to see the world in this really neat microcosm, in this little neighborhood I grew up in, and it was a tough neighborhood too, so you learn how to manage fear really early. So there's nothing that any guest is ever going to say to me on the red chair that'll ever be as terrifying as being 16 years old and running through a catwalk trying to get away from someone who's trying to beat the shit out of you, right? That is like, you manage fear at that age, I'm not afraid of any actor. You know what I'm saying? And this was through high school or, or just like being on, on the streets? That was really rough. Grade school, high school. But it wasn't like we knew it was a rough town. It was just so everybody. I mean, every neighborhood's boys beat up boys. That's what it is, right? You know, you get into fights. You're especially guys like me. I'm lippy, right? I, somebody would, I wasn't strong. I was really weak. So if someone wanted to pick a fight with me, I would just mouth off to them, which never works in your favor, right? The lippier you are, the more likely you're going to get punched in the mouth. Um, but that's how you learn. I learned when to shut up because, oh, if I keep talking, someone's going to pop me. So all these little lessons I learned, like from this neighborhood, this biosphere that I grew up in, um, it kind of helped guide me out of my misguided energy. You know, it's like, oh, why don't we harness this a little bit? Why don't we harness it? So you have a good teacher, you have a good mom, you have a great aunt, a great uncle, all this stuff, a great sister. So they push in a little bit. Then the community pushes in a little bit. Then you read an interesting book as a kid and that pushes in a little bit. Then you hear a record, that pushes in a little bit. And suddenly your, 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 you know, your shotgun splatter of energy becomes this narrow beam. And that beam is kind of your tunnel out of it. And again, this is all stuff that you think about in retrospect. At the time, you don't know that's what it is. But you can sort of look at, look afterwards and go, oh, I get it. I see how I was able to get shot out of the system and into this place, you know, through all those factors. It, it sounds like not only your mom, but also uh, you had an uncle that introduced you to a lot of things and, and started getting you more interested in, in current events and politics. Yeah, yeah. My uncle used to read the newspaper. I always wanted to be like my Uncle Paul. I think I still do. Um, but he uh, would read the newspaper and he would hand me a section. He started with the sports section. He would hand me the sports section. And then he would hand me the main, the front page section when he was done because he would then take the sports section. And, you know, he also bought me Sherlock Holmes books. He took me to see Russian independent cinema. I was 13. Soviet independent cinema, right? I mean, who does that? You know, who does that? He would also take us to see Back to the Future, but he would take us to see Letters to Brezhnev. Like, he would take us to see this kind of stuff. He would take me to see movies that he shouldn't have like movies that were much older than I should have been. But he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, just introduce you to stuff. But I don't even think it was super intentional. I think it was kind of intentional, but it was mostly just, yeah, man, you're interested in this stuff. Why don't you want to do it? He gave me a Tom Waits record. Loved it. You know, when you're a little kid, Tom Waits is a, is a line in the sand. You know, you get a Tom Waits record. And Tom Waits is still really underground at that time, right? But hit, there were no hipsters at the time. <laughs> who kind of embraced it. You get this line in the sand. You either like it or you don't. If you like it, you're in. Tom Waits. You're part of the group. Or... Yeah, you're part of the group of the older guys. And I always wanted to be, and maybe this is one of the things about growing up in, in the neighborhood, and I don't understand about younger generation, is I never wanted to see myself on TV. I never watched any show that had guys my age on it. Why do I want to see my life reflected back at me? I have my life. I always wanted to be older better read, more interesting, because I recognized, even at that age, that this is boring. This isn't who I want to be. I mean, I, I think, you know, when much music and channels like that started putting on these reality shows of teenagers on here, I thought, oh, here comes the slippery slope of dumb culture, because even though the shows could be good, if you watch television relatably more than you watch it aspirationally, I don't think you ever really grow I don't think it was many opportunities to grow, right? So my uncle was like, I was like, I'm going to do this, do this, try this, hey, listen to this. 
you know, once you understand Tom Waits or as best you can at that age, Dylan makes more sense to you. You know, I love Bob Dylan and always have. But Dylan and Tom Waits, you go, oh, there's two different ways to do what Tom used to call the hobo's lullaby, right? There's too many different ways to be this. Like, oh, look at the dark and crazy this guy. Is. Then I saw Alice Cooper and went, holy cow. Like it was, ha then Slayer came out, holy cow. Look at all this. But because my uncle introduced me to, well, I mean, I guess the best way to describe it then was alternative or to counterculture, then it was natural that when the you walk into the room of counterculture, when you walk out of the back door of that room and there's way more counterculture, I was open to it because my uncle introduced me to that kind of stuff. And was the part of the reason you so identified with uh, some of these like the punk bands and sort of the, the alternative culture was that uh, it felt by outsiders for outsiders? I, I, maybe in retrospect it did that. I think at the time I just identified with angry music. That's, that's all it was. Like, you know, I don't know if I thought it maybe maybe because I was very weak, I thought if I listened to heavier stuff, I didn't even think about it, but when I identified with heavier, rougher, aggressive stuff, uh, people were more afraid of me. Right, so if I walked down the street and I had a T-shirt that said Metallica on it in '85, which is Metallica wasn't big, right? But I had a Metallica shirt on '85, and my head was shaved on the side, you know, kind of like splotchy shave. My friend used to, uh, Bobby used to shave it with a hand shear, like a sheep shear, but he'd have to like hand pump it to shave my head. Um, people would be more afraid of me, right? So, so I found in metal, mostly heavy metal, and to a degree punk rock, but mostly heavy metal was a was a, a, a community where I could, where a bunch of skinny little kids couldn't go in and be bad, right? And people stayed away from us. So that was part of it. So you I felt powerful or you felt? You just felt safer. Well, you just felt like you you limited the amount of people who would fuck with you, sort of to where. But that's what it was. But, but that's like the benefit. The truth is I just loved the sound. I remember hearing Slayer. I remember hearing Slayer. And for whatever reason, it worked. I remember hearing, I was still younger than 10 when I heard Welcome to My Nightmare by Alice Cooper. My mother used to call me Johnny Cash when I was 10 because I would only wear black. And, you know, who, where does that come from? Like, I don't know why I saw Johnny Cash and identified with that. I don't know why I heard um, uh, South of Heaven and identified. I'm Sure, I guess I was rebelling in some sense against the church, but why do I even want to rebel against the church? At 10 years old, I don't know enough to think there's no such thing as God in my head. But at 10 years old, I knew that something didn't ring true. So that wasn't my consciousness. That was my chemistry, right? So so uh, your, your mom was was very religious when, as yeah, you were, is, yeah, yeah, still is. Uh, um, evangelical? I mean, she, she doesn't even, she doesn't identify. She's a, she's a Christian. So that's, so she's an extreme Christian. But I think that she says, I don't believe in religion. I believe in God. That's what she says. And so already from that early age, like 10, you didn't, you didn't believe in God or, or were no, sort of... I mean, I sure, I believed in God, but I didn't, but I never acted like I did. So that's how I realized I didn't believe in it. Um, of course you believe it. You're terrified. You know, I remember saying to Bible school at a young age and being told I'm going to hell. Going to hell. Okay. How do I not go to hell? Like this. Okay. But what was interesting, I remember a guy tried to introduce me so the concept of hell, I was, oh, I was like six, and I was in this Bible class. Man, Christians have no idea the damage they do to some kids. Sometimes, it works on others. But here I am in this garage, in this like makeshift Bible class, and this guy holds up a sign, a picture of an album, a picture. And he talks about hell, terrifies me, terrifies me. I go home, I pray like anybody else, I suppose, who's caught up in that, in that game would. But the vision stayed in my head of that album cover. So one day I'm at a record store and I see that album cover. So I buy it. <laughs> what is it? What is this that's so scary? And I put it on. Maybe I was eight. No, maybe I was older than that, 10. And I couldn't believe how great it was. So... I was told to fear hell, but when I heard Highway to Hell by ACDC, I was in. I'm like, wait a minute, this speaks to me. I'm in. Slayer comes out, I'm in. My mom doesn't know why it happened. I don't know why it happened. I watched this show called Hilarious House of Frightenstein where I would, would be too afraid to watch it by myself, four years old. I would make her wake up and watch it with me in the morning. She said, you for some reason were drawn to this and it was werewolves and Vincent Price doing horror stuff. I've always been into horror when I was little at the library like we spoke about earlier. I remember sneaking behind, I saw a bunch of older guys walk behind this curtain so I followed them. 
I sat in the front row and I watched for the first time Night of the Living Dead. So she said it was like the lights went off in my eyes. Like I just love that kind of culture and art. I don't believe in the devil. I'm not a, you know, I don't, I don't believe in that stuff. But for whatever reason, in my chemistry, it it worked. Found me, my, my social networks in high school. It got me a radio job in Kelowna when the guy said, do you know anything about metal? I really do. All right, you got it. When I went to Much Music, they asked me to host the new music. I said, I would, but I want to host Loud. That was my stipulation. They didn't want me because Loud didn't have a host. I wanted to do a metal show. From that metal show, I took my love of metal and punk rock and added a punk show to it. When I worked at CFNY, I made them do a metal show and a punk rock show, and we did it. So this thing that I fluked into at five or six or seven years old... Um, it was actually much more helpful than the math class you uh, failed. It's the most helpful thing because when I wanted to, when I started the hour on CBC and I wanted to get people to show up, I couldn't get big name talent. Big actors wouldn't come on, but Alice Cooper would because my metal credentials were tight. Right? Yeah. I could get Alice Cooper. I could get I could get Noel Gallagher. I could get the Foo Fighters because my music was tight because I had already built that stuff. Right? And the other sidebar to this, which I haven't said much before, but while I was consuming all that art whatever that was, I was getting it from two radio stations, Q107 and CFNY. And that's why I got into radio, right? Because I grew up listening to John Derringer, later Alan Cross, but Bob Mackowitz, those guys just bring in the noise, you know? When you're a kid, man, and you hear like Cashmere for the first time, if you're predisposed to liking rock and roll, I mean, forget about it. It's game over, right? This is like, because I'm old enough, this is way before internet, way before, I mean, I would go to the library, sign out an album, and put another tape deck beside the album to tape it over the air, <laughs> you know? Anyway, that's a long, convoluted answer to your question, I hope. Um, and so you eventually, like you mentioned before, go to study radio at, at Humber, um, and, uh, and it was almost like a, you know, off-the-cuff dis decision. When did you actually get turn on to it in the sense like, yeah, this is this is what I want to do and I want to make this happen. Maybe, you know, I always wanted to do it. But I was still, I was, I was 20, 19, 20. I was in college, partying, having fun. I liked it, but I didn't do the work. You know what it was? I didn't do the work in the electives. So I cared about the radio classes. I didn't care about the other classes that they made you take. And at some point, I had a teacher called Keith Elshaw who said to me, Look, I get it. You don't like school. Uh, he said, here's what you need to do. You need to look at your marks, not like marks. You need to look at your marks like currency. Your marks are money. And it doesn't really matter how much money you have in life. But if you want to get into this business, you have to buy your way into it. But you can't use real money. You've got to use marks. Because marks are an indicator that you paid attention. This isn't like some arbitrary essay in English class in high school. This is a lesson you'll need in your career. So let me tell your next employer that you comprehended enough to earn this mark. The mark is your currency to buy your way out of here. And I was like, well, that's a really good point. Yeah, okay, I'll do that. That's exactly what happened. I'll do that. So I remember going, I went back home. I found all the reading material I was supposed to read uh, during the school year and I brought it to school. I had like left it somewhere. And I, on my lunch breaks, I just started reading the material. That's it. I just decided, I guess I'm just going to pay attention now. And it was a horror literature class I took as an elective that helped me trigger that. I'm like, oh, I'm going to start reading. So I'd read the books. I would do the work on it. And then somehow from that, I got a job and it's been nonstop since. So I'm the same guy now that was the same guy sitting at the L section of Humber College, you know, reading those books. And, and do you remember when you thought, okay, I could actually make a living doing this? Like, so you, after you graduate, you go to Kelowna to do like an in internship? I in Kelowna. I never, I didn't think you could actually make a living at this until maybe my ninth season at CBC. No, even then. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, like my second year at Much Music, I started to think, oh. But I knew Much Music was going to be a bizarre transition for me because I knew that I had only a few years to be there. And then I, then I didn't know what that would mean. Much music VJs, a lot of them hadn't really gone on to, you know, extended TV careers at that time, if you think about it. A lot hadn't. New music hosts had gone on to do stuff. Abby Lewis, Trailblazer, Daniel Richler, Trailblazer. Richler had the big life here on Newsworld, right? It's a great show. 
Richler, uh, or, or um, Avi Lewis uh, had counterspin here. Great show. Denise Stalin became Denise Stalin, you know. So new music hosts had done something. So I thought, well, maybe I have a shot. But I didn't know what that was. Like, I didn't know. And, you know, it's only been like the last maybe four years here at CBC where I have a sense that maybe I could do something with this career. Like, seriously. Like, I started my first, first on air in 92. And it was really like 2008 where I was like, hmm, maybe. What, what do you mean by that? Well, you just expect it to go away. That, you, that it's not going to fall, fall off uh, tomorrow, that uh, you actually have some stability, you mean? Well, not stability, but you know that the show could go away tomorrow, but I've built up enough of a reputation and have enough experience that I might have some skills that are transferable to another job. And before you didn't have that sense oh, at all? God, no, man. Being a much music, like, what am I, what, what I going to do? I could only do music at that time. No one knew that I could interview politicians. Even when I did the CNN show, man, they, people I worked with that had no idea that I had interviewed presidents. They didn't know, or prime ministers. They just thought, oh, you're the guy that interviews celebrities. And then they're like, no, no, here's what else he's done, you know? You're like, here's what else he's done. And um, so it just takes, like, you, you, no one took a 27-year-old much music guy seriously. And why would they? Like, why would they? So I can go on TV and talk about Britney Spears. Hardly a valuable skill, right? But what happens over time is the communication skill develops. And I remember at Much Music one day I was talking on the air and suddenly I heard a voice in my head, not in a um, literal sense, but I, I could feel this other um, voice in my head directing me, directing my pauses, directing where I looked. And it was a breakthrough for me because I, and I remember it being on Much News. It was a Friday night, the 8.30 hit. And I remember they're going, Oh, oh, I get it. Oh, so there's, I'm not just talking. Now it's craft. You sort of understood the language by that point. Yeah, and it, but it was understanding the craft of it. And once I understood, like, it's like somebody pulled back the curtain and showed me the machine of my delivery. And I don't know who this is, just this whatever. And once I saw the machine of my delivery, I went into that room and I started tweaking. You know, I'm, I'm on the air. I'm the same guy that I've always been on the air, but I'm a tweaked version this year. I'm always working on the craft of this, right? And I think that's what will maybe keep me employed. But you never know. You never know. When when you made the transition, so you were in radio for several years in, in Toronto and started hosting, uh, and then you got called by, by Much Music out, out of the blue? Is that true? I got called by a guy who worked at a record company who said, it's not public yet, but the host Byron Wong of New Music is going to leave I think you'd be really good at it. Do you want the job? And my initial thought was, I don't want to work at Much Music, right? But New Music was one of the few shows you had watched growing up. Right, because I would watch it on city TV. I didn't even have cable, right? So I'd never watch Much Music as a kid, except if they had the free cable weekend. Then we'd go to somebody's house who had it, and I'd try to watch Motley Crue videos. Um, that was the extent of it. Um, or Mark Knopfler videos, as it turned out, Dire Straits. But I thought, yeah, I would do the New Music, but I never really followed up. I mean, I called one guy. We had a meeting once and nothing ever happened. And then one day around Christmas time uh, with the late, great Martin Streak, you know, one of the defenders of the faith Marty was, we were doing a Thursday 31 night. And this guy, this had been like months after this first call. Some guy was kind of wandering around the, the, the studio. We were open to the public. And I had, I would let the kids come and sit at the booth with me. And we would just talk radio. And they would go on the air. We'd play songs. And I would really spend time with these kids. Because they would, took the time to come hang out. They probably would wanted to be away from their home, so why not us be a safe zone? And at the end of that show, this guy walked up to me and he goes, hey, it's uh, David Kynes, and I knew his name. He was the president of Much Music. And he said, so do you want to, like, talk about this? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, cool. So what he had done was stood at the station for, I felt like an hour, and just watched me work. But I didn't know what he was doing. He just watched me work. And then the next day, I got the call going, hey, do you want to come in? And I came in, I met with him, I met with Denise. I think they called me like 12 hours later or something and said, all right, go for it. Like that was literally how it all came to be. And uh, I'm glad I did it. It was a lot of fun. And was that a bizarre transition uh, for you going from radio to being an on-air personality where sort of people suddenly get a sense of like who you are and think they, they know you or yeah. your sort of recognition in public must suddenly, um, you know, go up tenfold or something like that. Was that a bizarre transition for you, especially coming from such a, a sort of unlikely uh, background or neighborhood to, to be a media personality? Maybe, but I didn't notice it. It was the same thing for me because I was felt like I was still on the radio. Even if you watch that early stuff of me on Much Music, I speak quicker. I'm, I'm not as articulate then. Not that I am now, but I'm certainly less so then. But you could see that I didn't care about the TV part. 
Like I was just a guy on TV. Like I, I didn't, uh, TV to me is a person. I'm, I'm comfortable on camera. I've always been, I'm, I'm a shy guy normally, but for whatever reason, when much music, the cameras went on, I was fine. I think partly because I knew enough about music that I knew I belonged there. That music was what I did. So I, if your foundation is something other than you, but it is the art you believe in, I think that's one way to be okay. Also, I was 27, 28 years old. So you put me on TV at 20, I'm not ready for it. But at 27, eh, of course I'm ready for it. Different, different age. You know, they were, I mean, they were hiring young VJs, you know, too young. 28? Oh, come on. I can handle this, you know. And the attention didn't bother me so much because I, I very quickly knew what it was. Like I knew what it was. It's like, oh, these people didn't pay attention to me before, but now they are. But I didn't resent them for it. I understood it. Why so you sort of trust it's sort of fickle. It's, it's you know, here today, gone tomorrow type yeah, thing. Yeah, and it is what it is, right? People are, when you're on TV, aside from people who are mentally ill and, you know, that you're doing, that, that's a serious kind of other part, part of the conversation, the way people relate to you if they're battling something. But there's no reason for them to know you. So it's not you that they really identify with. It's what you represent that they identify with. And that... I think sometimes does people's heads in because they want to be the one that is identified with. I never did. I understand what I do. I don't write the album. So why would I act like I wrote the album? I am merely the guy that connects you to the stuff you love. I try to connect you to artists. I try to connect you to politicians. I try to connect you to ideology. I try to connect you. But I'm not the guy who wrote OK Computer. That's a masterpiece. I didn't write it. So for me to be on TV and they go, how come you don't like me? Why would they like me? I didn't do anything. I'm really the guy that got lucky, you know, and my music comprehension allowed me to get a little more of the artist than maybe it would if I, if I didn't have that, right? So I never really dealt with it. Plus, I think when I was young, I didn't, I mean, I don't drink, right? So when you're young and on TV, if you don't drink or do drugs, you will rarely be in a bad spot. Rarely. So I was able to save myself from a, a bunch of bad spots because I was never fucked up. Can you beat me out when I swear? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. Sorry. <laughs> in 2004, I think before you get the hour at, at CBC, there was the Greatest Canadian yeah. uh, Contest with you know 10 great Canadians and nominated from a big list. You represented the eventual winner, Tommy Tommy Douglas, uh, Premier of Saskatchewan, introduced Medicare, all these all these sort of collective things. What what was it about? him and what he represented that drew you and what did that mean to you tommy douglas and, and how he saw canada well um i think that if trudeau was the architect of what the modern canadian identity you know decades removed from the post from the war the modern canadian identity of canada is much of what trudeau was and pearson built on were things that tommy douglas did first he had a bill of rights that predates the united nations obviously healthcare. um he let women in bars if you imagine that created an arts council when no one was doing that and balanced the budget a lot 17 years or something balanced the budget economically sound socially sound he was a pastor right i didn't relate to that part of him but i thought how interesting especially in that era when public christians are right-wing, public Christians spend so much of their time excluding other people, gay marriage, women, and they do. A woman can't be a priest in a Catholic church. There's an entire organization that gets an enormous amount of tax breaks from our culture, and women aren't even allowed to have a middle management job, never mind the top job. Blows my mind that people treat that organization like it's legitimate with the way they treat women. Blows my mind. Blows my mind. Um, but Tommy was not that guy. He wasn't perfect, but he wasn't that guy. It's like, oh, look at this. Look at this. What should be a contradiction in the modern world is not. He was compassionate. He was empathetic, which, as you know, are different. So I um, I thought, that's the guy. He was also the guy that nobody heard of. I was amazed when I, when I said I was going to do it. I told him I wanted to do Tommy Douglas, and they said, okay. Um, he was the one guy on the list that most people hadn't heard of out of a younger generation. So this man called Guy O'Sullivan, who I worked with at Much Music, we went and made it together. That film, we wanted to be funny. We wanted to really rep Tommy's legacy. At that, during the shooting of it, that's when they first approached me about working here. Um, but I said no. I was shooting this. I was I, that wasn't part of my plan. I didn't think I was going to do. So a lot of people thought that 
this was how CBC was going to launch me here. But it was really, I said no. You know, they, they didn't even know what show to offer me. We were just talking. One of the things I, I personally like about public broadcasting or the idea of public broadcasting, and that the same way Tommy Douglas had sort of a collective spirit and, and you know, we should look after each other, there should be basic protections, whether it's Medicare or, or workers' compensation, things like this. The CBC and, and public broadcasting at its ideal sort of represents. Mm -hmm. Now, you came from the privates, you came from much and, and things like the edge. Has your conception of why public broadcasting matters changed since you came to the CBC? And, and I guess if you've come to a philosophy, why, why does it matter that we have things like the CBC and public broadcasting at times when it seems like these sort of institutions aren't being valued? I believe that the airwaves belong to the people. Not in a left wing, right wing, centrist way, nothing. I believe the airwaves belong to the people. I think a smart, informed population is a good population. Politicians go on and on and on about how important education is. Okay, well, education extends beyond just your class, right? Education, access to information, access to information undiluted by corporate interests. Um, the private broadcasters have a responsibility. Their number one responsibility is to increase the value of their share for their shareholder. That's okay. That's the game. But as we see in other countries, America being one, if that's, the, if that's what everybody has to do, news will suffer. Information will suffer. 100% the case. Now, in Canada, we have corporate media, you know, to tell. You know how like in America or the rest of the world, they go oil companies run everything? Yeah, in Canada, telecommunication, telecommunications companies run this country. Um, but our news services are good here. CTV News is a good news service. Pardon me, Global is a good news service, in part because they're really good, but also because CBC exists, which keeps everybody in check, right? Everybody in check. Now, the thing about that, that CTV and Chorus and all those people don't want to really address is that they're the public broadcaster too, right? And they're mandated to do a lot of the things they do by the CRTC. Yeah, but here's the thing, man. They, they get money from the Canadian Media Fund, right? They get lots of taxpayer dollars, yet they have no responsibility to Canadians except to put what they call Canadian content. But they'll all tell you that it's the American shows that make the big money for them, right? So in my opinion, this which, is not... Which by regulation, they're allowed to put Canadian commercials on so they make a, a big profit off exactly. them. Exactly. So they get all kinds of breaks. They are the public broadcaster as well. We're the only ones that admit it. If, if you really want to have a free market economy the way with a public broadcaster the way they do, then private broadcasters should be forced to meet their Canadian content regulations, should be forced to, and not have access to public money. But they do have access to public money. So in my estimation, they have a responsibility to honor the public money. Tax breaks, man, tax credits, funding, go, go do the research and see how many shows they make, <laughs> scripted shows, right, or unscripted, don't get that money. I mean, there's everywhere. It's everywhere. So in this country, they're all the public broadcasters. CBC is just the only one who owns it, I think. Now, uh, I mean, part of the reason why I want to do this series is that it seems the critics of, of the CBC and public broadcasting or the NFB or these sort of collective institutions, even the, the Weed Board, which was dismantled, uh, seem to be very loud and very prominent these days, the free market idea that there should be no subsidies, there should be no public space. Of course, because cause where are they mostly critical? In, in the private media owned by the competitors. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it seems that even the CBC, though, even intellectually or uh, just with figures in Canada, it's, it's there's not the same sort of strong articulation of why the CBC, public broadcasting, arts, or collectiveness matters. You've said that the CBC represents the intellectual and emotional backbone of this yeah, country. Railroad. I, th I, th railroad. I think it's the railroad of this country, for sure. Because so what, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, if, if it was gone, what, what do you think the consequence would be? Oh, it would be enormous, man. Coast to coast to coast. Multiple languages. First Nations languages. Reflect the communities. Honor communities. Reflect diversity. Um, Hire people. Hire people is a big part of it. But this is the network that has shows like Sounds Like Canada, shows like The Current. This is the network that has the fifth estate. That changes laws. They debate it in the House of Commons, you know, stuff that happens on the national. That's what this is. You take that away. Who else is doing, who, who else is doing these stories? There's another rerun of NCIS. Does is that reflect the emotional railroad of this country, the emotional heartbeat of this country? Of course it doesn't. It's not bad. We should have NCIS, but this is an all Canadian primetime lineup, man. All Canadian primetime. You got a Mercer repeat, then you got me, you got Arctic Air, you got Republica Doyle, you got all these shows that are Canadian, by Canadians, for Canadians, and often about Canadians, right? 
It's important to do that. It's like Ottawa gets indignant when someone doesn't want a pipeline, right? But they don't care if someone wants to protect our intellectual pipeline. They don't value it. The thing that brings us together from different regions. Every culture is strong because of their stories and their relationship with each other. It's neuroscience, man. Words lead to mapping. Mapping is relationships. Relationships are all we are. That's all we are. And politicians, and not just conservative, because the liberals, by the way, are much the same, right? This country has only been run by a two-party system. Canadians often get smug about America, going, oh, Republicans and Democrats. We have the same thing here, right? Really, federally, only two parties run this joint. Um, although Boy Jack came close, didn't he? Didn't he come close? They don't respect in action, in effect, the most important thing, which is how do we relate to each other? They don't respect empathy. If they did, they would protect empathy. And not to overvalue it, but the public broadcaster is the public connection. It's the public connection. When stuff goes down, I want to see what Peter Mansbridge has to say. 9-11 happens, I'm watching Peter Mansbridge. You know, we were watching old footage of the Ken Taylor, uh, you know, what they were calling it, the Canadian caper, um, with, you know, getting the hostages out of Iran, seeing Knowlton Nash tell that story. Everybody wanted to see what Knowlton Nash had to say, right? We, we have to do it. Our number one responsibility at the public broadcaster is to reflect the people, not to increase the value of the share for a shareholder. Ask any CEO or any board of directors for any private company. Yes, they have interests that extend above beyond money. Of course they do. But the job is to increase the value of the share. That's the whole purpose. We have a very different shareholder and a very different responsibility to our shareholder here. I think that's important to know. And how vulnerable would you say the CBC is? It's gone through so many cuts, even starting in the 90s. Um, how, like, I think a lot of us take it for granted. On the inside, I mean, has it, have the cuts affected you? And how vulnerable would you say these institutions are? Yeah, I mean, I think that funding is really important because just it costs money to make shows. I mean, right flat out. It costs money to make shows. TV's not cheap. And people don't realize how little they actually pay. I think it's like 34 bucks, right? It's like 34 bucks a year. That's what a Canadian pays. 34 bucks to the CBC. That's it. In England, it's five times that, four times that, roughly, from a bigger population. And there's a TV set tax. People go, why don't you make shows like CBC, uh, like uh, BBC? Well, we do. We make shows that get a huge audience here, shows like Republic of Doyle, which are amazing. Really funny comedies, like obviously like Mercer, who's a game changer, man. 22 minutes predates The Daily Show. Game predates the onion. Game changers. We do make that kind of stuff. It just costs money. And know? especially things like uh, the nature of things or documentaries, those <coughs> particularly are hard to make on a for-profit basis. Almost impossible. Yeah, the fifth estate. Of course, journalism is expensive. You want real journalists or do you want to hire a 24-year-old with a blog and make them write your news story? That's not journalism. It's not. It's commentary. It's exploration. <laughs> but it's not journalism. Journalism takes time. Journalism costs money. And people need to, I think, need to spend more time understanding why journalism is important. But governments don't want journalism because journalism exposes them. That's why they don't want it. You think, look, look at the people that, not just Prime Minister Harper, but who, how Gretchen operated. They don't talk to the journalists for the most part because they don't want to answer questions. I don't think they respect it. I think if you don't respect journalism, you don't respect the public. You know, I really do. Safety seats, you know, safety windows, seat belts, all that stuff. It takes brave people to pick the fights. Well, it takes like Ralph Nader or someone to, right. to take on the system. Right. You, you got to pick fights. You have to develop a groundswell of support. You have to change stuff. And would you say that's what needs to happen? Because as soon as a party is in power, then any sort of goals or, or promises they made about funding the CBC or something that could potentially... You know, it becomes an annoyance once you actually hold office. Um, what would you say we, we need to do as Canadians who value these institutions if they're actually going to be sustained and, and um, strong and around for the future? I, I, I mean, I, so Canadians always say that healthcare and the environment are the two things that matter to them the most. That's what they always say. They never vote that way. So I don't know. I would. I don't know what to tell the Canadian voter to do. Do whatever they think is com what they're comfortable with. I assume. Um, but I guess at least appreciate that they, these things are vulnerable. And I think I think what you need is you need you need um, you need governments to understand the value of our stories and our voices. You need to respect the myriad of voices in this country, and you need to honor it. 
if I'm the government, I always want a strong public broadcaster. Not because I work here. It's like, I'm not going to work here forever. There'll be a time when I'm gone, but I'll still believe in the public broadcaster, right? That having lived in a couple of countries and watched the way journalism plays, man, a public broadcaster does keep people honest. It really does. Is it the most efficient place in the world? I don't know. What is it? But all these people that criticize the CBC from the outside, look at your own operation. Look at your own operation, you know? Rich companies are allowed to buy other companies and put Canadians out of work. I thought the government cared about jobs. They don't. They don't, man. They care about companies. <laughs> That's what they do. And it's not just Harbor. It's not just Harbor. Other countries too. Other companies, uh, governments too. They call them job creators. Are they? Are they really job creators? Look at the look at the math. It's really. It's just trying to get through all the bullshit of politics. To where are the good politicians? Honor the good politicians because there are great ones, right? Great public servants. Honor them. You know, I think that if you see Ken Taylor's movie, uh, Our Man in Tehran, you see how both Jimmy Carter and Joe Clark, you know, the president and prime minister, made the right choices, not for their own gain, maybe to their own detriment, right? That's leadership. Well, final question. I mean, you you, uh, you say you're not ambitious, but you're clearly, as, as you said, driven. Do you have any sort of idea of, of what you'd like to do? You've interviewed basically everyone who's prominent in, in Canada and, and America. Is there anything that uh, you still feel like you, you need to prove? Would you like to make it in the States or, or do you feel like you... Uh... Well, I mean, I, I, I want to work. I've sort of figured up as I got older that what I really want to do is work on cool stuff with my friends. That's what I want to do. I love this TV show. I love... Um, I can tell you 100%. And I know that people will listen to this conversation between you and, you and I and some people who hate the CBC and don't like me will pick things apart and go blah, 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 blah. And that's cool. Let them throw their voices in the echo chamber. We live in a culture where people just want to tear down and have no, no offering of how to build. I'm interested in building good relationships and positive stuff. I don't have to like it, but I want to be a part of lots of stuff. So... I look at my friends and go, well, I think we should make shows together. We should do this together. You know, on this show, I work with some of my friends. They're all my friends now, but some of my oldest friends I work with. And that's what I want to do. However I, I, I end up doing it is how I'll end up doing it. But it's not ambition. It's just like, you got I got a cool project. All right, what do you want? Can you help me make this? Okay. One guy calls me, hey, I'm making a movie. Can you come look at an edit and give me notes? Okay. And then I'll be like, hey, I'm making a movie. Can you come give me notes? Yeah, okay, cool. And then you just fill up the time and then you die. And that's okay, right? So I don't have any great uh, ambition as to what I want to, to to tick off the list. You know, I don't really feel, not work-wise anyway. It seems important to you to almost not not care. You've said if for a good interview, you need to get your ego out of the way. I can't predict what my brain chemistry is going to be like in five years. I can't predict what my family is going to be like in five years. I can't predict what the industry is going to be like in five years. I can't predict anything in five years. So why the F would I make a five-year plan? What a colossal waste of time. A five-year plan to me is the equivalent of saying, oh, my reward is in heaven. Seriously? Your reward is right now. Yeah, it's okay to have some eye towards planning and some strategy, of course, but that can't be what drives you, man. That cannot be what drives you, at least not for me. I'm not wired that way. I I really just want to, I want to do cool shit. Like, I want to do really interesting stuff, stuff that's meaningful, stuff, stuff that isn't about my gain. Look, I know that if I do good work with good people, then sure, I'll benefit from it. Of course, I'm not naive. And I want to benefit from it. I want to pay off a mortgage. I want to live a comfortable life in some respect. Um, but that's not the reason to do it. That is the added value. But I'm completely wired to believe in public service, man. This is about your relationship with others. And the, the more I hold on to that, the way happier I am. Because the more you make it about yourself, even inadvertently, you go mad. You drive yourself mad. You put expectations on yourself that are unreasonable. So I don't really care about 10 years. If I'm alive and healthy in 10, that's a win. The only goal I have is to be 96 years old so that I can sit in Ottawa on Canada Day for the 200th birthday of Canada. That's what I'd like to see. Canada turned 200. I'd like that. Well, f full circle, I guess, no expectations uh, actually do help sometimes. Yeah, totally, man. It's like it's a fluke. But again, um, I have a lot of passion. 
I have passion for music. I have passion for TV shows. I have passion for film. I have passion for people. I wanted to talk to you because I heard your interviews and I thought they were smart and engaging. And I thought, oh, I like this guy. I have no idea how many people will listen to it. Maybe some, maybe none. I don't know. But I Literally I, dozens. Dozens. But dozens are all I care about, right? If it's right. So you have good conversations. That's why I wanted to talk to you. Um, and maybe if good conversations where people can even disagree without being disagreeable to to work together on projects, maybe maybe it'll be a much more fun place to be, maybe. Well, it'll be interesting to see where you are in, in five or ten years then. I'll be open a motorcycle repair shop in the desert. I'll be producing TV shows, and I'll have a beard longer than yours, and I'll just be working on old bikes, and I'll be happy. Sounds like a pretty good life. <laughs> George Travlapas, thanks so much for joining me. My pleasure, man. Thank you. Well, that was my conversation with George Trombolopoulos. That's all the time we have for Broadcasting Canada this week. To find out more about the show, you can visit us online at broadcastingcanada.com. And there you can hear our other interviews with CBC hosts, ranging from Gian Gameshi, Anna Maria Tremonti, to Peter Mansbridge. If you like the show, please rate us on iTunes. Just search for Broadcasting Canada in the search bar. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook. Our handle is at Broadcast Canada. Broadcasting Canada was put together by myself, Kevin Kainers, with help from Eric Bedlam, Ken Stauer, Brian Colley, Sean Rasmussen, J.P. Davidson, Courtney Clinton, Joseph Novak, and Sharon Riley. And final word, as always, so what is it like to be a Canadian broadcaster? I never understand when people say they have no regrets. I have so many. <laughs> I have so many regrets. See you next time on Broadcasting Canada.